Today on Ham Radio Q&A, it's that time of the month where I open the mailbag and answer your questions, so please keep watching for more. Hi, I'm Michael, KB9VBR, your host for Ham Radio Q&A. I'm on a mission to inspire and educate the amateur radio community, so if this is your first time watching, please consider hitting that subscribe button. Well, first off, I'd like to thank all of my viewers, and especially the, the subscribers that helped push this channel over the 20,000 mark last month. I'm grateful for your support, and be sure to stick around to the end of this video, as I've got some news on um, upcoming videos, live appearances, and another um, upcoming live stream event. But in the meantime, now let's answer some questions that came up in the last month. So, starting out, most of my questions this month were uh, generated uh, from the recent video on the field test of the Redivis RT97 portable repeater. It was great to hear so many comments from other uh, fellow bicycling hams. Well, uh, the, the season is winding down, but uh, you know, maybe I can get another uh, bike, uh, cycling and ham radio video uh, done yet this fall. We'll see how the, how the weather holds out. But first off, uh, Lee asks, what are the re legal requirements with being uh, portable? This looks like a great piece of kit for portable stuff. You know, great video and thanks for sharing. In my previous video on the RT97, I do talk a bit about some of the legal issues uh, concerning this repeater. But in reality, there really isn't anything different you need to do with a portable repeater as compared to a stationary one. The biggest concern would be frequency selection. But most state and regional repeater councils have a pool of itinerant and shared non-protected frequencies. These frequencies can be set up so that you can deploy a portable repeater without interfering with any coordinated repeater. Just remember that these frequencies are designed for temporary use, so if you find your portable repeater is now on the air permanently, you know, please get it coordinated. JK asks, isn't the HT the limitation in this test? The advantage is multiple radios with the repeater in the middle. Quite possibly that could be true. The purpose of a repeater is to provide one-to-many communications to a set of users that might not otherwise be able to communicate point to point. I could have done this test with multiple people. Um, doing so, I would be able to measure the total distance between point A to point B to point C, but my goal of this test wasn't to show the total possible distance I could achieve with two handhelds and a repeater, but instead I wanted to uh, um, hear the quality of my own transmissions from pre-selected distances in an objective manner. Doing that allowed me to infer what kind of total range I could expect with this repeater. Which, in that vein, Liberty Forever says, a seven mile radius implies over 50 square miles of coverage. Not too shabby for a 10 watt portable repeater in a box connected to a mobile whip on your car and a hacky handy talkie. And you know what, that's a reasonable assumption you can make. Of course, coverage will be a terrain dependent and if you get into a low spot or behind a hill, your signal quality will really suffer. I did a rough projection of the repeater's coverage using Radio Mobile, and uh, you can see that it would potentially cover the, the entire city, but you'll also notice that the projection isn't fully circular, as to the north and to the west, there are hills that are going to be blocking the signal. Another question, Humax F1 asks, well, thanks for the field tests. Can you elaborate on the handheld laptop connection with the BTEC APRS K1? Does the laptop have a shared socket for audio out and in? This cable's popped up on a couple of videos, but I'm really surprised I haven't done a video on just the cable. Well, BTEC's APRS K1 cable is handy for um, connecting your handheld to a smartphone for APRS or other VHF digital modes. It has a tip ring ring shield connector on one end and then a Kenwood two pin plug on the other end and you know I've, I've used this cable so that I can turn my phone into an APRS tracker and I was pleasantly surprised when I plugged it into the combined headphone and mic port on my on my laptop that it, it worked so it's a really cool little cable and I'd, I'd recommend um, anyone interested in APRS to pick one of these as it makes it so easy to get started on that mode. Xander makes a very good observation. A very good review, but I did see you transmitting at the seven mile site holding the antenna not completely vertical. So how much difference would it give you if you held the antenna in a completely vertical position while transmitting? 
in in reserve, you you held the antenna in in re, in reverse. You held the antenna right, so the receive was normal. Keep those videos coming. Well, I looked at the original video footage uh, from the seven mile test. I made two test transmissions at that location. Uh, the first was quite choppy as I held the radio kind of askew and uh, was pointed in the wrong direction. For the second, I did reorient myself and hold the radio more upright. So let's listen to those um, two, two separate return transmissions. Uh, this is an excellent example of how you should hold your radio can make a big difference uh, on your fringe area signal quality. I guess the moral of the story is, is that to hold your radio upright, get it off your belt, and um, position yourself so that you can deliver that best possible signal. Moving on, in our video on measuring coax at nearly the speed of light, some of the viewers caught an error and we need to make a correction. And David points out, electrons and most subatomic particles don't travel at the speed of light in a vacuum. Certain photons do, and maybe all particles with no resting mass, but the point being is that most don't. Photons just do it without effort, and other particles such as electrons have to have lots of energy applied to them to get even close. But they'll never quite make it. And David and all the others, you are correct. Electrons themselves move quite slowly, and it was Joe's intention in the video to say electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves do move at up to 99% the speed of light. Thanks for catching the error. Also, Benjamin asks, what was, what was at the end of the 25 foot of tested coax terminated with? Was that open, short, or a 50 ohm dummy load? Well, we didn't terminate the cable at all. It had an open short at the end. Now, one of the purposes of a time domain reflectometer is to catch cable faults or breaks in the, in the line caused by an open short. A 50 ohm terminated cable would show an infinite length to the TDR. Additionally, as 707 states, with this, sem with this setup, you can see if you have old coax that is still 50 ohms by adding a variable resistor to an old SO239 chassis connector. Uh, by turning the variable resistor, you can eliminate the reflected waves uh, displayed on the scope. Then remove that resistor and measure the, measure the ohm value of it. This will tell you the impedance of the coax. You know, that's a really smart trick, and thanks for sharing. From our August live stream event, uh, Alan asks, what is uh, the two meter calling simplex frequency for D-Star in the USA? Well, to my knowledge, there is no official calling frequency for D-Star. It appears that uh, 146.580 is used in some parts of the US, but in using that frequency, you may run afoul of FM analog users in other regions. So I saw that uh, Fusion users are also trying to establish 145.5625 megahertz as their simplex frequency. Uh, this is in the two meter uh, digital packet portion of the band. And that might be a better spot for um, digital uh, voice users like Fusion, D-Star, and even DMR. It takes a lot of work to establish a nationwide frequency as you need general support and acceptance uh, from the, all of the various digital communities uh, to have them move into a certain frequency. Well, my advice is to check some of the DSTAR forums and other user groups to see uh, where other simplex operators uh, congregate and work as a group towards uh, moving towards a common frequency. And with that question, uh, this leads me into um, you know, thanking everybody that tuned into our live stream last month. It was a grand experiment and it totally exceeded my expectations. I'm working on producing another show, and um, I'll announce that date sh shortly. But to round things out this month, in addition to planning another live stream, uh, you can look forward to a video on um, crossband repeating. I should have another product review coming up, and uh, maybe even a ham fest video. I'm planning to attend uh, the Milwaukee Ham Radio Outlets Super Fest on Saturday, September 28th, and I'll have a table at the Chicago FM Club's Radio Expo in Belvedere, Illinois, on Sunday, September 29th. 
At Radio Expo, I'll be, in, I'll be in the indoor area with my VHF, UHF antennas for sale. So I'll look for my pop-up banner. Links for those two events can be found in the video description below. Now hopefully, you know, I can catch up with some of you and we'll have a chance to chat. Well, that's it for this month's questions. Please keep them coming. You can leave them in the uh, comments below. You know, I'll filter through them and uh, keep that conversation going. Yeah, you know, Maybe one of them will even show up on our next uh, Your Questions Answered video. For more articles and information, be sure to check out my blog at www.jpol-antenna.com. Uh, your support of this channel drives the production of future videos. So if you like this video, give me that big thumbs up. I really appreciate it. You can check out some of the other recommended videos here. And also don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already done so. Pressing subscribe and that bell notification will inform you when future videos are released. Well, that's it for this time. I'm Michael, KB9VBR. Have a great day and 73.